you've got your Bibles, we want to turn to Proverbs chapter 4. We're going to pick up in verse 18 today, where we left off last week. But I want to start today um, by seeing if we're all generally on the same page. Can we do that? Yeah? Y'all awake? Okay, there you are. There you are. Some of y'all are awake. So I want to make sure we're generally on the same page. We may have to uh, switch directions a little bit here, but these are pretty easy questions, and, and uh, I think being that you guys are here at church, we're probably generally on the same page with these questions. But how many of you, show of hands, actually let's do amens this morning, we'll change it up a little bit, we'll do uh, amens if you agree with this, all right? If you're out there online, you can hit the, the like button uh, for your amen, because we can't hear you even if you say it. Uh, how many of you would agree... That all things considered, in general, the path of the righteous is better than the path of the wicked. Okay, most of you are on the same page with me. How many of you would agree that your children should walk the path of righteousness rather than the path of wickedness? All right, good, good. Last one. How many of you would agree that your life is better when you're on the path of righteousness over the path of wickedness. So you've learned that lesson, I'm assuming, the hard way, just as I have and and most of us have. Those aren't hard questions, are they? You know, we, we could really sum those questions up and we could really sum our entire text for today in Proverbs chapter 4 up with this big idea. The righteous path is always right, And the wicked path is always, any guesses? Wrong. The righteous path is always right, and the wicked path is always wrong. Now, I realize we live in a world that will tell you differently than that. I realize we live in a culture that will tell you there is no right or wrong, that, that, that right is what you think is right, and wrong is what you think is wrong. And if you just follow your sweet little old heart, it'll lead you the right direction and all those kinds of things. But the reality is, is the Bible paints a different picture for us. The Bible says the righteous path is always the right path, and the wicked path is always the wrong path. It doesn't matter what your opinion of the path is. It doesn't doesn't matter what your perspective of the path is. It it doesn't matter what what path you think is going to be more fun or more lucrative. It, It doesn't matter what your overall perception of the scenario or situation or circumstance is. The righteous path is always right, and the wicked path is always wrong. In our text, we start with the result. That's point number one today, the result. And I love that this text starts with the result. Uh, Every path we take has a destination. We've talked about that at length. We've talked about it numerous times in this series. Every path you take has a destination. So every path you choose is important because there's a result attached to the path you're walking on. The path you're on takes you somewhere. It produces something. The righteous path is going to lead you to the right places, and the wicked path is going to lead you to the wrong places. There's a result, a destination to every path you choose in life. Look at verses 18 and 19. The path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, shining brighter and brighter until midday, but the way of the wicked is like the darkest gloom. They don't even know what makes them stumble. I don't know about you, but one of those sounds really, really good, and the other sounds absolutely awful, right? One path sounds like a path I would want to be on, and the other path sounds like a path I would want to avoid. One sounds right, and one sounds wrong. But here's what both paths have in common. They're both going somewhere. They're both going to eventually help you get to a destination, not the same destination, but a destination. So let's look at these two paths and what the scripture tells us. Let's look at the right one first, the righteous path. It says the righteous path is like the light of dawn shining brighter and brighter until midday. That's a beautiful picture, isn't it? 
It's a wonderful result of walking down the right path, of the righteous path in life. How many of you have ever been up early enough to see the sun come up? Okay, some of the young kids don't have their hands up. They, they haven't been up that early yet. But isn't it beautiful to watch the sunrise? Especially if you're out there when it's dark and you see those first rays poke over the horizon. If you've ever watched the sunrise, you know that it's not just a beautiful sight when the sun comes up. It's not just an incredible feeling. It's not just an incredible reminder of God's power and God's grace and his mercy and the newness and the freshness of a day. But you know this, it just gets better and better and better. It gets brighter and brighter and brighter. From the moment you get the, the first glimpse of a new day and those first rays start, and then within 30 minutes, it's brighter and brighter. This says it gets brighter and brighter until the noonday sun. Now, this time of the year, about the noonday sun is when it starts getting worse and worse and worse around here, right? Because it's just getting hotter and hotter and hotter. But he says, man, it's, it, it's, it's like that morning sunrise that gets brighter and brighter and brighter. That's what the path of righteousness looks like. The right path, the path we want to walk on. The idea there is this, the longer you stay on the righteous path, the longer you stay on the right path, the more faithful you are to staying on and being on the right path, the better things are going to get. If you approach your marriage or your money or your parenting or your spiritual life or your physical life or your emotional life or anything else in life, your career, if you approach anything from a point and a path of righteousness and you stay on that path, the longer you stay on it, the better things are going to get. The longer you stick with it, the better things are going to get. Brighter and brighter is that path going to be if you stay on the right path. Because blessings multiply. And the longer you stay on it, the easier things get. And all in all, the path lights up and things just become simpler and easier and brighter and brighter as you're following the Lord down that path. I'll give you an example from my own life, uh, my family's life. When Abby and I finally decided to start doing money God's way instead of money the world's way and money the culture's way and money our parents' way and money the way our friends were doing money and everything else, we said, we're going to do this. We're going to get on this path, the righteous path, and we're going to actually look at what the Bible says about it, and we're going to do it. When we first got on that path, it was a very, very hard path. When those rays of sunshine were first just poking over the horizon, there were times we didn't know if we were going to be able to stay on the path. There were times we were very tempted to get off the path. But because we've stayed on that path year after year and month after month and paycheck after paycheck, and we've resisted for the most part the temptations to get off of that path, We've reached a place now where that path, those blessings have multiplied. It's gotten brighter and brighter, and things have gotten better and better. And that principle of the path, that principle that's at work here, works in every other area of your life. It's been the same with our marriage. We've had hard times in our marriage, but we've stuck with it. We've stayed with each other. We've worked through things. And I would say things have gotten brighter and brighter and better and better and easier and easier because we've stayed on the path of righteousness in that area of our life. It would be the same for your business. It, it would be the same for anything you do in life. The longer you do it, the more you stick to this principle, the brighter things are going to be because the righteous path is always the right path. And the wicked path is always the wrong path. Let's look at that other path, verse 19. But the way of the wicked is like the darkest gloom. They don't know what makes them stumble. Things get darker and darker on the path of wickedness. Things get harder and harder on the path of evil. And things get so hard and so dark, you find yourself in a place where you don't even know what's making you stumble anymore. You, you don't even know how you got there. You don't even know how you ended up there. You, you don't even know why you're there. 
The righteous path is always the right path, and the wicked path is always the wrong path. You might say, but yeah, Pastor, but you, you don't know. I mean, you don't know about my certain situation or my certain circumstance. You, you don't really understand the dynamics of my family or the dynamics of my business. You don't understand what, what I'm going through. You don't understand what I'm feeling. And you're right, I don't. But I do know this, right is right and wrong is wrong. And you cannot do the wrong things and expect to get the right results. I know that to be true. In any area of your life, in any circumstance or scenario you can come up with, you cannot do the wrong things and expect to get the right results. I want to ask you a question. This is a serious question, not, a, not an out loud question, not a respond back to me with amens or raising your hand question. This is a question I would actually encourage you to write down and think about this week. And really think about it and challenge yourself with this. This is a serious question. Have you ever once in your life regretted doing something God asked you to do? Or God told you to do? Have, have you ever regretted it? Have you ever regretted doing something God's word commanded you or called you to do? Have you ever looked back 5, 10, 15, 20 years later after doing something the Bible's way instead of the world's way and said, you know what, I sure regret doing it God's way? Have you ever really pursued righteousness, holiness, or Christ-likeness and come to the end of that path and said, you know what, that was the wrong choice? I haven't, because the righteous path is always the right path. But I get it. It's hard to do the right thing. I know the pursuit of holiness is not easy. I know that being a righteous man or a righteous woman in this unrighteous world is hard. I, I recently took a group of... Um, people over to Greece, and we followed through the footsteps of the Apostle Paul. The first place we went, the first major biblical site we went to on that tour was Philippi, and I've always been fascinated with Philippi my entire life as a believer. I've loved the book of Philippians. It was really, in many ways, a, a dream come true for me to be there in this ancient city. And we spent several hours there. We went to the little stream where Paul baptized Lydia, the first convert, there after he had gotten his vision. We, we learned about how hard life was in Philippi for the early believers. For Paul, walking into this ginormous city where there's no church, there's no believers, there's, there's, there's no Bibles, you know, there's none of this stuff. We went to the cell that Paul and Silas were actually imprisoned in, there in Acts, and we just stood there and we talked about the significance of, of that place, but really the hardships that these people faced in the early church. And that night, as I was reflecting on the day, I, I read this scripture in Philippians 2, 14 through 16, and it just hit me in a, in a powerful way. It said this, it says, do everything without grumbling and arguing. This is Paul writing to these Philippians who are living in a really tough culture. So that you may be blameless and pure children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation, among whom you shine like stars in the world, by holding firm to the word of life. Then I can boast in the day of Christ that I didn't run or labor for nothing. Paul said, do what's right and avoid what's wrong. He says, I, I know you have a lot of opportunity here in Philippi, there in Philippi. I know you have a lot of opportunity to make the wrong choices, to go down the path of wickedness. But I'm encouraging you to do what is right and righteous. Not because it's the easy path, but because it's the right path. And that's the path you want to be on because that is the path that's going to bring you the result you desire. A life that gets brighter and brighter and brighter like that sun that creeps up over the horizon. He encouraged them to do it, not because it was easy or not because it was popular, but simply because it was right. And simply because the righteous path is always right, and the wicked path is always wrong. 
You see, getting the right results starts with doing the right things. From the little things all the way up to the big things. We have this misconception that if we do the big things right, everything's going to fall in place. Can I tell you, the little things are just as important as the big things. We've got to be people who are pursuing righteousness in all areas of our life if we want to end up on the right path and stay on it. After we get the results here in Proverbs, we get to what I call the recommendations. The recommendations. And these recommendations might at first seem somewhat general and and broad as we go through them. And we're going to go through most of them pretty fast. But the reality is, if you think about it, they really do impact every area of your life. Each of these six things are going to help us choose the right path or the righteous path, stay on the righteous path, and ultimately end up in the right destination. The first one is the one we're going to spend the most time on because it is the one that all the other ones hinge on. It's the one, if you don't get this one right, none of the other ones that follow it are going to even be possible. It's simply this, you got to pay attention. The recommendation here is pay attention. Look at Proverbs 4, 20 through 22. My son, pay attention to my words. Listen closely to my sayings. Don't lose sight of them. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health for one's whole body. Four times here, Solomon says, pay attention. He says, pay attention because this is important. Look how he says it over and over. First, he just says, my son, pay attention to my words. Then he says, listen closely to my sayings. Then he says, don't lose sight of them. Pay attention. And then he says, keep them within your heart. Have you ever told your kids to pay attention? Have you ever said, listen up? Listen closely to what I'm about to tell you. Don't forget this. Have you ever told an employee or a friend? Have you ever ever looked somebody in the eye and said, please don't forget what I'm about to tell you? Haven't we all done that at some point in our lives? We do it all the time. And we do it when it matters. We do it when it's, there's something important on the line. We do it when there's something we really need people to pay attention to. And here's what we have in our text, my friends. We have one of the wisest people ever to walk on the face of this planet saying, pay attention. Listen. We haven't talked a whole lot about the wisdom of Solomon in this series, but I want you to hear how wise he was. 1 Kings 4.29-34 through 34 says this about him. God gave Solomon wisdom, very great insight and understanding, as vast as the sand on the seashore. I mean, we're talking Gerald Hill level wisdom right there. <laughs> Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the people of the East, greater than all the wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser, and then it goes on and it lists some names of people that he's wiser than. But the important thing to notice is this. This was not human wisdom. This was wisdom God gave Solomon because he asked for it. And it was vast wisdom. It wasn't, it wasn't a wisdom that was just limited to spiritual things or theological things. It, it was indeed greater wisdom than entire nations possessed, according to the text. It wasn't just theoretical wisdom or theological wisdom. This is wisdom that that stretched out. If you look at verse 33, it says he spoke about trees from the cedar in Lebanon to the hyssop growing in the wall. He also spoke about animals, birds, reptiles, and fish. I mean, he had real wisdom and understanding about all kinds of things in life. And this is what made his wisdom so special And it's why everybody wanted to get advice from this guy. Look at verse 34. Emissaries of all the people sent by every king on earth who had heard of his wisdom came to listen to Solomon's wisdom. Imagine if nations from all over the... And I know you're going to have to use your imaginations here. But imagine if nations from all over the world sent their emissaries, their advisors, their ambassadors their officials, 
to talk to our president to gain his wisdom. People, people don't come to talk to our president to get wisdom. They come to talk to our president to get money. But people from all over the world are visiting this man, not for his money, but for his wisdom. Now, why would I tell you all of that? Because when somebody who's this wise says, my son, pay attention to my words, listen closely to my sayings, don't lose sight of them, keep them within your heart, we might want to pay attention too. If we want to walk on the right path, the righteous paths of life, we've got to pay attention. We need to pay attention to the Word of God. We need to pay attention to the friends that we keep in our inner circle. We need to pay attention to the words we speak. We need to pay attention, attention to what we're spending money on. We need to pay attention to what we're spending our time on. We need to pay attention to our spouse and the health of our marriage. We need to look around and we need to really be honest about the path we're on and pay attention and figure out, is this the right path, the righteous path, or is this the wicked path, the wrong path? Because the righteous path is always going to be right and the wicked path is always going to be wrong. And if we're not careful, and if we don't pay attention, we will be deceived, we will be duped, and we will potentially be destroyed by the devil. He's not called the great deceiver for no reason. He doesn't want you walking on the right path, the righteous path, the path that's going to get brighter and brighter and better and better. He wants you to walk on the wicked path, the wrong path, the one that's going to get darker and darker and darker. And if you don't pay attention, that's where you'll end up. James talked about the importance of paying attention in a different way. Listen to what he says in James chapter 1, verses 19 through 25. My dear brothers and sisters, understand this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. That sounds like paying attention, doesn't it? Quick to listen, pay attention. Or you're going to go down the wrong path. Verse 20 outlines that. For human anger does not accomplish God's righteousness. That would be the wrong path, the wicked path, not the righteous path. Therefore, ridding yourselves of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, humbly receive the implanted word which is able to save your souls. What's James saying? He's saying pay attention to the word of God. Seek God's righteousness because God's righteousness is always right. Rid yourself of wickedness because wickedness is always wrong. Pay attention, he says. Look at verse 22. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, catch this, he's like someone looking at his own face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and he goes away and he immediately forgets what kind of person he was. In other words, he didn't pay attention. He looked in the mirror and he looked at himself, but he walks away and he forgets immediately because he didn't pay attention. But the one who looks intently into the perfect law of freedom and perseveres in it and is not a forgetful hearer, somebody who's paying attention, but a doer who works, this person will be blessed in what he does. He says, pay attention to what you do. Pay attention to how you act. Pay attention to how you live. Pay attention to what you're pursuing. Don't, don't, don't just look at it. Don't just come to church and hear it and leave and do nothing with it. He says, you better pay attention to it because that is going to be the difference between somebody who gets on the right path and somebody who gets on the wrong path. Don't just look at your face and then quickly forget about it. Pay attention. This person will be blessed, he says, in what he does. Everything that follows these other five things all depend on your willingness and your ability to pay attention. Because paying attention matters. If you don't pay attention to your marriage, what do you think is going to happen? Righteous things, right things, or wicked things and wrong things? If you don't pay attention to your budget, what's going to happen to your budget? 
If you don't pay attention to your kids, what happens to your kids? If you don't pay attention to your health, what happens to your health? If you don't pay attention to the Word of God, what happens to your spiritual life? You end up someplace you don't want to be because you did not pay attention to the path you chose to walk down. you got to pay attention because the righteous path is always right and the wicked path is always wrong. Now what comes next are five things we need to pay attention to. And we can run through these pretty quick. They're not difficult to understand and we've already covered some of them at length in this series. The first one is your heart. You need to pay attention to your heart. We spent an entire sermon a few weeks back talking about the danger of following your heart. Solomon points out many times in the book of Proverbs how dangerous that is, but Jeremiah summed it up the best in Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is more deceitful than anything else and incurable. Who can understand it? So you better pay attention to your heart. You better keep a close eye on it, and you better make sure it's not ruling you or making decisions for you. This is why the text says, guard your heart above all else, verse 23, for it is the source of life. If your heart leads you down the wrong path, if your heart falls in love with the world, If your heart falls in love with wicked things, if your heart becomes hard toward the Lord and the things of God, if your heart doesn't long for but instead rejects God's word and his scripture, if you don't pay attention to your heart and its condition and making sure it's pure and it's right, good things are not coming your way. Your day is not going to get brighter and brighter. It's going to get darker and darker. So pay attention to it and guard it. There's a difference in guarding your heart and following your heart. There's a difference in what we guard and what we follow. We follow as believers the Spirit of God. We follow the Word of God. We follow the commands of God. We follow the will of God, but we pay close attention to and we guard our hearts because if we don't, we will fall in love with ourselves and the things of this world. And we will do wrong and wicked things in the eyes of God to make our little hearts happy. So we pay attention to it. We guard it. Next, he says, you better pay attention to your mouth. Proverbs 4, 24. Don't let your mouth speak dishonestly, and don't let your lips talk deviously. Now, let's be honest. We can all get a bit mouthy at times, can't we? If we don't pay attention to our mouths, they'll get us in big trouble, won't they? James said it like this. If anyone thinks he's religious without controlling his tongue, his religion is useless, and he deceives himself. himself. You better watch your mouth. Turn to your neighbor and say, you better watch your mouth. You got a teenager, you can tell him twice. You better watch your mouth. You better pay attention to it. Because that thing right there, it'll get you in trouble. That hole in your face... It'll make your whole world a nightmare if you don't pay attention to it. It'll get you on the wrong path in a hurry. James gets even more detailed and blunt about the dangers of your mouth in chapter 3. Listen to it, James 3.3. 3. Now, if we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we direct their whole bodies and consider ships, he says, though very large and driven by fierce winds, they're guided by a very small rudder wherever the will of the pilot directs. So too, though the tongue is a small part of the body, it boasts great things. Consider how small a small fire sets ablaze a large forest, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue, a world of unrighteousness, is placed among our members. It stains the whole body, it sets the course of life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Every kind of animal, bird, reptile, and fish is tamed 
and has been tamed by humankind, but no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in God's likeness. Blessing and cursing come out of the same mouth. My brothers and sisters, these things should not be this way. Because the righteous things of God are always right and the wrong things that are wicked are always wrong. Have you ever seen those guys who get into a a pit with a bunch of rattlesnakes? See them a lot of times at festivals. And they'll get in there and they'll mess with them and they'll talk to the crowd and they'll talk about snakes and rattlesnakes and this and that and the other. And then some of them, they'll, they'll sit down and they'll let them start crawling on them. Everybody goes, yee. Some of them will even get into a sleeping bag and they'll put rattlesnakes into that sleeping bag and they'll lay there real still. And the whole time these people are in the pit doing these kinds of really crazy things, you know what they're trying to get you to think? They're trying to get you to think they're not paying attention. They're trying to get you to think that those snakes don't bother them. They're trying to get you to think that those snakes aren't a big deal. But you know the one thing I promise you every single one of those people in that pit is doing is paying attention. They're just real good at making you think they're not, but they are paying attention to every snake in that pit. They're paying attention. You know why? You can't tame a rattlesnake. You can feed it. You can pull it out of its cage and hold it real careful and pet it nice and gentle every single day of its life from the time it's a baby. You can protect it. You can cuddle with it and hold it. You can love on it. You can bring it in when it's cold and give it a warm place to stay in for the night. But you quit paying attention to it for one second and it will kill you. It don't care. You can't tame it. And that, my friends, is why we pay attention to our mouth and our tongue. It can't be tamed. A slip of the tongue can ruin a relationship. A gossip session with your friends can destroy your testimony. A coarse joke can wound a friend. Or turn them into a foe. You better pay attention to your mouth. Because it will take you down the wrong path if you don't. Next he says pay attention to your eyes. Verse 25. Let your eyes look forward he says. Fix your gaze straight ahead. Hear me church. Listen to this. Your feet go wherever your eyes are fixed. Your feet are going to go on whatever path your eyes are fixed on. What you're looking at and focusing on matters because that's where your feet are going to go. Your feet are going to follow what your eyes are fixed on. Your feet are going to take you to whatever path your eyes are looking at. Look at Proverbs 21.4. The lamp that guides the wicked. The lamp that guides the wicked. What is that? Haughty eyes and an arrogant heart is sin, it says. So you better pay attention to those eyes. They matter. Jesus said this in Matthew 6, and 23. The eye is a lamp of the body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. Sounds good, doesn't it? Sounds like a day that's getting brighter and brighter. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. So if the light within you is darkness, Jesus says how deep is that darkness. What we focus on matters. What we look at matters. Because your feet are going to go wherever your eyes are fixed. If you're on the wicked path, if you're on the wrong path in life right now, I'll make you this promise. You can take this to the bank. I'll bet you any amount of money you want to bet on it. If you're on the wrong path, if your kids are on the wrong path, if your grandbabies are on the wrong path, Any wrong path you've ever ended up on in life and can look back in hindsight and go, that was the wrong path, I promise you this, your eyes are not innocent bystanders in the process. Your eyes get fixed on something and your feet follow it. 
That's why we got to pay attention to our eyes. Hebrews 12 tells us what our eyes should be fixed on. Starting in verse 1, Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, the path that God has for us. And then look at verse 2, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. Because your feet will follow whatever your eyes are fixed on. Some of you, your feet aren't following Jesus because your eyes aren't fixed on him. Your eyes are fixed on other stuff. And so your feet keep taking you down those paths. He says, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The righteous path is always right. The wicked path is always wrong. Fix your eyes on righteous things, and you will find the right path. Fix them on the wrong things, and you will find the wrong path. Verse 26 tells us again to pay attention. Call this careful consideration. Verse 26. Carefully consider the path for your feet, he says. And all your ways will be established. The point here is that we must be intentional and diligent about the path we put our feet on. Too many people never consider the path they're on or the path they're about to enter and walk down. Solomon says, listen He says, carefully consider the path for your feet. It matters. And then he has this last bit of advice. Stay with it. Stay with it. Verse 27, don't turn to the right or the left. Keep your feet away from evil. Stay with it. If you've ever tried to walk down the righteous path, you know it's not easy. If you've ever tried to get off the wicked path or the wrong path and get over onto the righteous path, you know there's all kinds of temptations, all kinds of trials, all kinds of reasons not to do it. Jesus said this in Matthew 7, 13. He said, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who go through it, many who go on that path. But he says, how narrow is the gate and how difficult the road that leads to life and few find it. Nobody says the righteous path is easy. I'm not trying to tell you that the righteous path is a simple path. In fact, you're going to have to stay focused and stay alert and pay attention if you want to stay on the right path in life. Because it's very easy to wander off and get onto the wrong one. You're going to have to stay with it. You're going to have to wake up every day and stay with it. You're going to have to stay with that budget. Not just for a week or for a month or for a year, but you're going to have to stay with it for the rest of your life if you really want to have what God has for you on the righteous path. You're going to have to stay home when your buddies are going to the bar. You're going to have to stay in the Word even when you don't feel like it, even when you're disappointed or mad at God, you're going to have to get up and read His Word and say, Lord, speak to me today. You're going to have to stay pure when the world says, who cares, go have some fun. You're going to have to stay with it when your marriage gets a little rocky and things get tough. My friend, staying on the right path requires you and I to stay with it because it's not going to be easy. That's why he says, don't turn to the right or the left. Keep your feet away from evil. Stay with it. Because the righteous path is always right. And the wicked path is always wrong. You've got to stay with it. I hope you will, and I hope you'll choose wisely. I hope you'll pray and consider what God's Word says about your scenarios and circumstances in life. And I I hope at the end of the day you'll fix your eyes on Jesus and you'll fix your eyes on God's Word and you'll choose the right path, which is the righteous path. And I hope that when the devil comes along and he tempts you to get off on the wrong path and the wicked path again, you'll be able to withstand that temptation and say, no, sir, not this time, I'm staying with it. Let me close by saying this. This is not just about finding the right earthly course in life so you can have more money or so you can have better health or 
so you can have a better marriage, so your kids will be better. This isn't just about what we get here. Sure, there's blessings for being on God's path here. But there's an eternal nature to this as well. Eternally, there's a righteous path that is right, and there's a wicked path that is wrong. The righteous path goes through the cross, through Jesus, through his blood, through his gospel, and its ultimate destination, because all paths lead somewhere, is heaven. The wicked path is through yourself. It's through this world, it's through this culture, it's through your own pleasure. It's through this world and the ruler of it. And that path goes somewhere too. It just goes to a very different destination. It goes to hell. How narrow is the gate and difficult the road, Jesus said, that leads to life and few find it. My friends, the path you choose matters. Not just for here and not just for now, but for all eternity. So choose wisely. If you have never said yes to Jesus, if you have never said yes to forgiveness, if you have never come and repented and given your life and your heart and confessed that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, we pray you would do that today as we close. Pray with me. If that's you and you need to give your life to the Lord this hour, we invite you to pray with us. You don't have to come to the front or to raise your hand, but just pray with us. There in the stillness of your heart, if you can hear my voice, say, Lord, it is me. I confess that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed things up. That I've wandered onto and walked down many wrong paths in life. So today, by faith, I ask that you would forgive me. That you would make me new. That you would change me from the inside out. Lord, I thank you for your grace and for your goodness, for your love, for your patience and your willingness to die on that cross for me and to save me from my sins. Help me to walk on the path you have for me, the righteous path in the days to come. Father, as we close this time, I know, Lord, I know there are many with a lot on their minds and hearts. Some struggling with the decision they have to make this week about the path they're going to choose. Some looking back with regret on wrong paths and wicked paths they've taken in the past that still to this day bring about consequences and regrets in their life that they can't seem to ever get over or through. Father, some who just are fearful because they see a friend or a family member, a son or a daughter or a grandson or a granddaughter going down a wrong path and it seems that no matter how much they pray and how hard, Lord, they try to counsel them and bring wisdom to their life, they, they just don't listen. And Lord, some who just feel overwhelmed by all of it because even though we know that the right path and the righteous path walk hand in hand and the wicked path and the wrong path walk hand in hand, our world keeps telling us different things. Including there is no right and there's no wrong. So Father, there's a variety of stuff that you're going to have to help us with and give us the courage to fight against. And I just pray that you would. Lord, I pray if nothing else, we would remember that the righteous path is always right and the wicked path is always wrong. Lord, that you would tuck that away into our hearts and our minds and that we would choose wisely, that we would put our eyes fixed on the right things, that we would watch our mouths and our hearts, that we would stay with it when it's hard and we would just remember righteous path is right that wicked path is wrong and that would be enough to give us the courage to choose well and choose wisely Lord be with those who are making those decisions and struggling with these things 
Bless them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.